Hello there, my fellow superhuman criminal scum, and welcome back to some 40k lore. In today's Legion video, we arrive once again at everyone's favorite bat-helmeted psychopaths, the Night Lords. But today we're gonna have a slightly more special episode on them. Since I kinda covered the Night Lord elites and specialists in the Legion structure video, for today I thought I'd go over the history of their Adramentar elite. And this is an equally epic and tragic story. Word the wise, I do recommend watching the Night Lord's Legion Structure episode first, as it might help you understand things a bit better. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Following the massacre at Isvan V, Horus sent Primarch Conrad Kurz and the Night Lords on a special mission. This was a campaign of genocide against the Imperial strongholds of Heroldar and Framas in the Aegis subsector of the Eastern Fringe. The objective was to protect the flanks of Horus and delaying the Dark Angels Legion from reinforcing the Loyalists. This bitterly contested, and which would soon become known as the Framas Crusade, would drag on for nearly three years. At the height of this brutal conflict, the Dark Angels executed a meticulously planned ambush on the Night Lord's fleet, while it was in transit across the subsector, and this saw the back of the Night Lords broken and the Primarch seriously wounded. Thanks to the skilled coordination and superb execution by the Lion, the fleet of the Night Lords was devastated, losing dozens of capital ships and approximately one quarter of the Legion's strength. All this resulted in the death of all but a dozen of the Atramentar, and the capture of the first captain Sevatar and the remaining survivors. Conrad Kurz ran away from the wrath of El Johnson, evading the Dark Angels for months afterwards, stalking the shadows in the bowels of their mighty capital ship, the Invincible Reason. Somehow, the remaining Night Lords managed to effect an escape and fled into the void. In the latter days of 010 M31, a brutal storm engulfed the isolated system of Sotha. The ragged fleets of the Night Lords, fresh from the murderous crucible of the Framas Crusade, destroyed the orbital defenses of the Ultramarines and seized control of this remote corner of Ultramar. Such an act would quickly draw the ire of the Lords of the 500 Worlds, whose warships outnumber those of the Night Lords and seemed an ill-considered onslaught if the prize was nothing more than a frontier world at the edge of the Imperium. Of course, the world of Sofa had something far more valuable than any resource. It had the artifact known as the Pharos. This device was the key to the Ultramarine's defenses, and the prize that would allow the Warlords of the Night Lords to claim the favor of Warmaster Horus. And one among these desperate Warlords was chosen to lead the initial assault on this planet. Clawmaster Tsar Siakar. This was a warrior whose ambition outstripped his caution, and he boasted of the victory that his army would win at Sofa, even as the assembled Night Lords looked on. Such a victory would see him rise far in the esteem of the leaderless Legion, with the Night Hunter missing since the final battle of the Framas Crusade, and grant him a chance at real power. However, few of the more established captains of the Legion cared much about this upstart. The grim veterans granted the Clawmaster the opportunity, with several even offering the supply of warriors from the elite Atramentar to support his assault. Blinded by their dreams of glory, Siakar took them at their word, and moved his vessels to the vanguard of the fleet. The planetfall of Clawmaster Siakar was preceded by a barrage of macro cannon shells and incendiary munitions indiscriminately dropped among the habitation zones to demolish buildings and ignite a conflagration that would quickly spread throughout the city of Sophopolis. Waves of drop pods and planetary assault craft quickly followed, carrying the bulk of seven companies, with Siakar's company and the Atramentar in tow. Thousands of missiles streaked up into the sky on trails of burning Prometheum, followed by volleys of laser fire from Sofa's entire defenses turning the skies into a seething storm of fire. Yet, for every drop pod that perished, dozens more landed among the outskirts of the city to disgorge their deadly cargo. Within just a few hours, the horizon was engulfed in black clouds of smoke as the Night Lords rampaged throughout the streets of the dying city, falling upon the hastily drawn ranks of the Ultramarine's Aegida Company 
as they vainly try to defend the city and the inhabitants. Clawmaster Siakar presided over the assault from the personal command Spartan assault tank, coordinating the actions of his warriors as they swept into the city. Serving as his personal guard were a cadre of the elite Adramentar Terminators. These particular vicious killers were drawn from the missing Captain Sevatar's first company, which was now spread among the warbands and companies of the Legion to act as enforcers of the other warlords. The invasion quickly turned into a massacre, the Night Lords venting the rage of their defeated Framas at the defenders of Sofa. The Ultramarines engaged in a fighting retreat, buying time with their lives, holding makeshift roadblocks in a valiant attempt to evacuate as many civilians as possible. The overwhelming numbers of the enemy began to tell though, and the Ultramarines rigged charges to send sections of the buildings collapsing across the Night Lord's line of advance, crushing legionnaires and blocking the passage of armored vehicles. Still, the 8th Legion came on. Siakar and the Atramentar crushing all resistance beneath the treads of their tanks. Packs of night raptors ranged ahead of the tank formation, leaping over the wreckage using controlled bursts from their jump packs to land among the warriors of Ultramar and slice them apart with serrated swords and viciously hooked axes. One by one, the pockets of resistance across the city were surrounded and eliminated with the wounded survivors often dragged away to suffer unspeakable torment in the torture pits of the Eighth. The tattered remnants of the Ultramarines' garrison chose to make a stand at Attican Square, a natural choke point where all the roads led to the Castellum. Centurion Viron Eckar, the last of the Ultramarine officers left in the city, took the opportunity to rally the withdrawing forces of the Legion. Meanwhile, the Night Lords, being Night Lords, couldn't pass on the opportunity to flay some poor civilians alive. Despite all the chaos of the retreat, the disciplined Centurion managed to assemble a sizable force of defenders, including the Suzerain bodyguard. These warriors locked their shields together in front of a marble statue of Gilliman carrying the torch of Imperial Unity, determined to hold beneath the gaze of the Primarch and delay the enemy long enough for those that had already evacuated the city to fortify the Castellum against the Night Lord's assault. A pair of deredeo patterned dreadnoughts took up position on either side of the monument, ancients Menario and Argon, training the barrels of their anvil assault cannons to the skies, while alongside them, the few remaining Predator and Sicaran tanks of the Ultramarines blocked the enemy advance towards the Castellum. The Night Lords responded in typical fashion for their cruel nature, herding hundreds of captured civilians into the square each with their eyelids sewn together or their eyeballs plucked out of their skulls. Behind a throng of unfortunate Sofans came squadrons of the Night Lord's land raiders and rhino transports, speeding into the square with the still living bodies of captured ultramarine neophytes pinned to the hulls of their vehicles. The tanks of the 13th Legion belatedly opened fire, stunned into inaction for a brief but decisive moment and though several of the enemy vehicles disappeared in a storm of explosive rounds and plasma blasts, most of them crossed the square unharmed. The assault group of the Night Lords rolled over the stumbling civilians, leaving trails of broken bodies and rivers of blood behind them, as they came to a grinding halt before the ultramarine position. Assault ramps dropped with a resounding crash, and through the darkness of their interiors came the despoiler and the terror squads of the Eighth. Scores of renegade legionnaires charging at the cobalt blue shield wall with a murderous fury. The lead night lords lashed out with chain blades and bolt pistols, seeking an opening in the shield wall that would break the formation. Many of them found themselves hurled back by the boarding shields slamming together as one. The shield wall opened and the suzerain cut the closest night lords down with swift strikes of their legatine power axes before closing ranks again. The charge lost momentum and faltered, many of the Night Lords forced to defend themselves while others were still pressing the attack. The Ultramarines fought in the disciplined manner that the Legion was famous for, blocking and thrusting with their power gladii to either kill or maim the opponents. The Night Lords fought as brawlers and murderers, using the bodies of their fallen as stepping stones to jump over the shield wall where they dragged their enemies to the ground hacking at soft armor joints and firing their bolt pistols point-blank into eye lenses. 
Xiphon interceptors and fire raptors in the midnight blue of the 8th legion dived from the sky and flew through the streets to strafe the rear of the ultramarine's position. They suicidally braved the Castellum's anti-air defenses in an effort to drain the ammunition reserves out of pure murderous spite. Dozens of ultramarines were torn to shreds and predator tanks were reduced to flaming wrecks before a stream of armor-piercing rounds from the ultramarines that at their ancients sent the enemy aircraft crashing into the buildings of Sophopolis. The ultramarines and the night lords dead littered the ground. The 13th defensive formation now reduced to only a third of its original size. The shield wall reformed around the statue of Gilliman, its features now scarred by gunfire and stained with soot and blood. Time seemed to slow down as they both fought to a bitter standstill, with both sides stubbornly refusing to yield. With the battle stagnating, a lone Spartan assault tank, sitting silent among the Night Lord's vehicles, powered up its engines. Sensing that the Loyalists were now weakened enough by the expendable troops, Siakar and his aloof Atramentar guard deemed it was the time to enter the fray and claim an easy victory. The Spartan crashed into the close press of the Ultramarines and the Night Lords, indiscriminately grinding armored bodies into pulp under its mighty tracks. The shield wall broke, and the Night Lords poured their numbers through the gap to swarm the beleaguered defenders. The Spartans' hatches opened up, and out of them charged Siakar and the Atramentar. Hulking warriors clad in debased midnight blue Tartarus pattern Terminator plate festooned with grisly trophies torn out of human bodies. The Atramentar lashed left and right with their Nostraman chain glaives, butchering all in their path. The Centurion barely held his ground against these monstrous Terminators, his surviving three suzerains rushing to their lord's defense. One of the Atramentar grabbed a nearby Night Lord and shoved him in the way of the charging suzerains delaying them long enough for him to shoot one of the Ultramar's champions through the chest with his plasma blaster before crashing into the rest, wildly swinging the chain glaive in wide arcs. Still engaged in combat with the other Atramentar, Viran Ekar failed to see the dark form of Siakar stepping in behind him. The bladed fingers of a crackling lightning claw erupted from the Ultramarine's chest, tearing apart both his hearts, before the helmet and head were ripped brutally from his body by the warring teeth of a chain glaive. With the death of the commander, the remaining ultramarines were truly broken, and the last of their number fell among the shattered armor and buckled shields of his brothers. Only corpses and ash marked the brief stand of the ultramarines in Attican Square, and Clawmaster Siakar stood upon the verge of glory, his position among the warlords of the Eighth Legion all but guaranteed. But, as the Clawmaster paused to cut his mark upon the bloodied, torn corpse of Centurion Ekar, the Atramentar assigned to him closed about him, blades raised and bolters cycling. The Terminators grimly followed the orders given to them in orbit, to eliminate this vainglorious fool who dared to step beyond the station. Siakar had forgotten the strictures that the Night Hunter had instilled in his sons. Glory and honor were worthless, and victory was fleeting. It was only the will to wield the knife that mattered, that and the strength to direct where it fell. Following the death of Iago Sevatarion, aka Sevatar, at the conclusion of the Horus Heresy and the Siege of Terra, the Atramentar mostly dissolved, which some, like the apothecary Talos Valkoran, believed was due to Sevatarion's successor, Zo Sahal, being a non nostraman Although the Atramentar respected Sahal, they had no affection for him. And when the Atramentar disbanded after the death of Sevatar, their resistance to Zo Sahal was born from something far more than simple prejudice. Some of the first company were Terrans, the oldest warriors in the Legion. But there was more to the affair than just Sahal's birth world. Being Terran, Nostraman, or anything else for that matter, never really mattered to most of the Night Lords. They were divided because, with the Primarch gone, this was every traitor legion's fate over time, as the realities of the allegiance to Chaos, no matter how ephemeral, manifested themselves more strongly. Centuries later, when a member of the Atramentar was questioned by Mercutian, a member of First Claw, 10th Company, 
He replied that the first company was dissolved because the Astartes felt that nobody could live up to the legacy of Sevatar. The Atramentar as a whole would serve no one after Sevatar died, as he had made them into what they were, a brotherhood that couldn't be broken any other way. In the same way, the members of the Eighth Legion would serve no single captain after their Primarch died. It was not their way, just as most of the traitor legions ultimately fragmented into many different warbands. Allegiance to Chaos ultimately always bred division and fractious internecine conflict, no matter how powerful the worshippers proved to be. Following the death of the Primarch at the hands of the assassin Meshen on Tsagwalsa, the Atramentar would scatter along with the rest of the legion and by the time of the 41st millennium, they often served as bodyguards to the mighty Chaos Lords who commanded various Night Lords warbands, but never in groups of more than a handful. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate for you today on the history and story of the Night Lords Atramentar Elite. I would say that their overall fate is kinda sad, but then again, they were Night Lords, and they definitely don't deserve a lot of sympathy. Still, I would still pick the Night Lords as anti-heroes, so to speak, over the word bearers, for example, any day. Also, while I didn't get into it in this video, the Night Lords were one of the few Chaos Legions that didn't go full Bible thumper on the Imperium. They always just did their own thing. As always though, I do welcome your thoughts on these fellows in the comments below and look forward for a Sevatar video someday as well. Do leave a like, share, subscribe, and click the bell icon for future content. Thanks a lot, and the Emperor protects.